You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Happy mid-May readers. This is the time of year, a tantalizing time of year, when all of our beach reads that we've been waiting for since last summer are starting to hit bookstores and bookshelves everywhere we go. And among the most highly anticipated has got to be The True Love Experiment, a follow-up to the instant New York Times bestseller, The Soulmate Equation. Only this time, of course, we're focused on the fabulous Fizzy, who has got to be one of the greatest heroines um, in rom-com history, right? A romance writer who has <laughs> lost her mojo can you imagine that until she meets a super hot producer who is tasked with a reality show putting together a reality show and she is going to be the star finding her perfect match so let's welcome back to the podcast today the writing duo known as christina lauren ladies it is so wonderful to see you christina hobbs lauren billings um i cannot imagine how excited i missed out on the first book i'm gonna circle back to it um but I loved this so much, and I, I, I know that readers, I as a reader, love when we see the recurrence of a character storyline, but something is completely fresh and standalone, but you're giving that little reward to your regular readers. So tell me about the connection of these two books. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for having us. It is so good to see you again. You have just such fun energy. It's always so fun to talk to you. Um, so The Soulmate Equation was our 2021 release, and it's a story of the single mom, Jess, whose best friend Fizzy is a romance author, and Fizzy hears about this genetic matchmaking service that um, Fizzy, and so Fizzy drags Jess to go do it, even though she doesn't want to, and it turns out Jess ends up matching with the founder at sort of the founder of the company at the highest level imaginable, and they kind of ask her to pretend to date him because it's really good PR for the company. And I know you don't really like this guy, but maybe there's something there. And of course, then they end up falling in love. And after we went on book tour for that, our readers just really wanted Fizzy to get a book. And we had never really planned to do that until we had an idea um, several months later. And we were like, this is going to be perfect. And we really wanted to see Fizzy get her own happily ever after. And just having her have lost her joy felt like kind of sad because in the soulmate equation, she's just like the joy of the book. And so we wanted to figure out how she would find her way back to that. And of I, course, it's with Connor. I was so excited to hear that from you because I was wondering if you guys had in mind that she would always be the focus of a story uh, later on or if it was reader reaction because she is the kind of person that you want to spend time with. She's just super unique, totally confident, a really cool chick. And uh, it's she's kind of like that role model for people who are like wanting to just make their own rules. And then she peels back the curtain on your industry as well and all of the, the things that we're looking for when we're creating romance that people can get excited about. And I mean, it must be really fun to dig into a character like her who generally knows exactly what she wants, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's sort of what was hard is that if you meet Fizzy in the soulmate equation, she kind of seems like she's got her life all together. She seems happy and like she knows exactly what she wants and she's like is going after it. And so when we sat down and really thought like, do we want to write a, a book about Fizzy? It's like, how do we take this character that was initially just meant to kind of help guide Jess on her way or for like comedic relief and that kind of thing? How do we make her be a vulnerable reader? Like, how do we make Fizzy the main character? Yeah. And um, how do we find her vulnerabilities and where she's struggling and all, what is her story? And so as soon as we found, like as soon as we realized that Fizzy had lost her joy, um, it all sort of came out. Her voice was very clear from like that first chapter. The real problem came in Connor because it was like, now how do we find this person who deserves all of that? Mm -hmm. She has um, an, a, a very free way of expressing herself. <laughs> she's a, She's got a, 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 a lifestyle of being physically free, very in touch with her own sexuality and her own, you know, vibrancy. And so it is It is surprising to see anybody like that uh, get shook up with her, you know, having a, a, a momentary lapse in confidence or even um, a disinterest in men in general for her. So as you're crafting Connor and you're putting all of these pieces together, you're bringing in an industry that I imagine the research that he notes in the book is correct, that the same audiences that love romance novels and rom-com novels love 
reality shows. I know that mm-hmm. I am a reality show addict. And so mm-hmm. this was like speaking my language on so many levels. Yeah. 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 And I mean, it's, it was fun to think about like who, who would be watching this show that we're, we're creating, who would be using this technology that we invented in the first book. And, you know, for Fizzy, she is in a romance author who's writing love stories. And she has this epiphany at the beginning that she has never been in love before. And so what more fun could you imagine than taking that person who thinks she knows everything there is to know about love and showing her that maybe that's not actually true. And for writing Connor, you know, he's a hero who she comes into it and she sees every man as sort of an archetype, right? She's like, well, you're the hot dilf. You're the, (laughs) you know, the, you know, sexy nerd. You're the tattooed bad boy. You're this and that. And in the end, he's, this man that she can no longer kind of categorize as one thing um and it was just really fun to imagine like how they man navigated this reality show together but also the depth of their friendship that sort of was under beneath the surface of all that like they really became friends during this the connection between them was so great and how it evolves Mm -hmm. and and also just the way from from through her eyes the way he evolves and popping up in all of these different roles and then realizing oh crap like this guy is all of those things rolled up into one yeah. and that makes things a little bit confusing i laughed out loud as fizzy did and i won't i don't want to give anything away but some of the revelations as they're basically looking for these these types that she has you know that she knows from writing and she wants them to be cast in real life and of course we do see this when we watch reality shows I mean we see when we see the guys come in on the bachelorette or you know or, or vice versa we know that's the this that's the that we're trying to you know check all of the types but to really find somebody who's going to identify so much so that they're willing to put it on their name tag um, <laughs> yeah. you I like seriously like dropped my my uh Kindle when I the vampire was met because that I was like oh my gosh you're hilarious I could not figure out how you were gonna do that so there's so many little moments of treasure and a lot of joy and fun throughout the course of this book um tell me how it works between the two of you when you are going through these archetypes and you're trying to think about who who are going to be the romantic interests in a book that you're writing so normally we, so we'll, sometimes we start with an idea, sometimes it's a character. So once we have our character, the way that we really do it is we never write a book, like no two people complete each other. It's who is this person who is perfect for our heroine or our hero. So in this, it was who is the perfect man for Fizzy. And so in this thing, she thinks she has him all figured out at the beginning. You know, she thinks he's a Delphi. She thinks he's a hot millionaire. She thinks he's all of these (laughs) things. And he ends up being so much more the thing that she can't actually like pinpoint what he is because he's all of these things that she needs and has always been looking for. And so that's really what we do. We try to build build this character up to be the perfect match for them, to complement them and make them sort of the best that they can be. And ev- nobody needs another person, but it's amazing when you find that person that makes you feel like your best self and like helps you be your best self. Well, yeah. And I think, you know, just to like add on to that, when we were thinking about the different archetypes, it was actually to like, we made this huge long list of hero <laughs> archetypes. And then we kind of like whittled down which ones would be most fun. But if you actually think about it, the same as for the same for Connor, where he isn't just a hot millionaire, you know, he's also a hot dilf. He's a lumberjack. He's like the everyman for her. <laughs> that each of these heroes is also more than just their label, you know? And so it was fun to imagine like who these men are and like the, what they put out to the world, but then who they are like more deeply Mm -hmm. well I think what's so there's so much comedy in in the fact that we get to hear the way that fizzy thinks about men and and it's um in in a in a higher level humor wise um and witty quick way uh it's more how we think about men kind of compartmentalizing women putting them in a category Mm -hmm. right and it's so liberating and exciting and funny to Mm -hmm. listen to uh you know her talking with a friend and and just being so candid about about the way that she is able to make snap judgments based upon her experience and what she knows about men 
Yes. yes. We all <laughs> wish we were as cool and fast, but it is busy. <laughs> right? And so uh, she reveals, as she's talking about kind of the the, the formula or the craft of, of writing romance, how the community is so important and that uh, the heroine has to have the, 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 the right people around them, right? And the hero has to have the right people around them. And that becomes something that um, is needs to be addressed in, in, in the finding of her partner. So it really is, though... As you guys are doing character development, because we know we're going towards a happily ever after, these people, every single person is is the, maybe the ones that are bringing in even more surprises sometimes than than even the protagonist. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, happily ever after is that is the promise that we as romance authors make to our readers. And so we know going in and it's, it makes it a hard genre to write if you think about it, because the readers always know how the book ends. And that's a comment that Connor makes like this is actually not probably the easiest thing to write. Um, but, you know, within that happily ever after the um, the f foundation of the community, the scaffolding of the community is so important because there's no happily ever after if it's just two people uh, isolated alone together, kind of with no family, no friends. And, and you know, romance authors take that very seriously. The community is a huge part of a happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, you know, Jess and River are going to be there, that Ash and Elle are going to be there, that Juno and Stevie are going to grow up with this sort of larger than life family. Um, you know, it's really nice to build that community and, and especially at the end where you get some of Fizzy's family together. And I just, I really love, I think Christine and I both really love writing that scaffolding around our two main characters and how their community influences their love story. Mm -hmm. Juno and Stevie, come on. <laughs> you so in soulmate equation you'll meet juno and i think she just she and fizzy both stole every scene they're in so i think you'll really love her in that one she's so fun in that book there's so much fun this, this book is just so 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 much fun um you two are uh, about to be on a very busy book tour uh not coming this way sadly to arizona but um you're enjoying some concerts your love of live music and in particular a band <laughs> known as bts definitely makes it into the pages of this book when we're uh, going to a concert and having a an experience that is like revelatory for everybody involved will you talk a little bit about that um, so we always say that, you know, like our characters don't speak for us. But one thing with Fizzy is her, like the weight that she puts on the importance of joy and finding your joy and celebrating it and protecting it. And Lo and I's favorite thing, you know, so there's a group in this book called Wonderland. And um, if you read our acknowledgments, we say Wonderland is not BTS, but we are inspired the joy and the happiness um, and the inspiration that they give people is very similar to how we feel about bts so going to concerts being surrounded by people who are as excited about something as you are and it is it's sort of this like i wouldn't say like religious experience but we are all experiencing this thing together like physically and it is just our like absolute favorite thing to do it's how we like fill our cup and it's our sort of like best bonding time mm -hmm. it is i i could not agree with you more i mean to me live music is that uh, live music and also i i would say in some circumstances theater like a, a yes. musical is so cathartic it's transformative it's like all of the emotions and like joy and everything but but so intensified because you're around people who are having the same experience yes. it's like yeah. changing changing you um what do you each Will you each tell me like your, what you remember your first like amazing concert experience was and like how you were acting and like what weird little bits you remember about it? I mean, my first concert was Aha, who sang like Take On Me. Mm -hmm. And I went with a friend and her parents because the dad was like sold the big speaker equipment to bands. <laughs> and so we got like free tickets and I loved it. It was really fun. But the first concert where I lost my mind yeah. was Depeche Mode. Oh. I went. <laughs> And I was in like the fourth row and Dave Gahan like had this super sweaty shirt and you could tell he was just like, uh, and he like took it off and threw it and it like slapped me in the face. And I was just like, <laughs> I was like 13 and I was like, Oh God, I was like so grossed out. And of course somebody behind me just yanked it and took it. And I was like, yuck. And I mean, now I can totally see everyone was like, give me that, give me that shirt. This is <laughs> but it was honestly so fun, you oh. know? And it changes you that feeling of just the adrenaline and like they're right there and the music I love is like right in front of me. There's just nothing like that. It's you know? crazy. 
So um, this is a good example of how everything old is new again, because I have a 22 year old daughter and I just got her tickets to Depeche Mode. And what was like, that was my, first, you know, yep. um, my first concert, I was 16 years old and it was Ozzy Osbourne and I had backstage passes and my daughter now, her one dream is to see Ozzy Osbourne. But when I was 16, he was on the No More Tours tour. It was supposed to be his last <laughs> tour. And this this is probably the coolest thing that to her, this is probably the thing I have done in my life. That is the absolute coolest is this photo of me with Ozzy Osbourne when I was giant 16. hair, giant hair, bangs. Yes. And, oh my wow. God. So yes. cute. Uh, you did not have to like bite the head off a pigeon or anything. No, I didn't. Okay, I didn't. Good. And I wasn't even there to like see Ozzy Osbourne. I think I was there to like most excited to see the group Slaughter that was oh, with yeah. them. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I had these passes and like, what? how insane is that? 16 year old, just like. <laughs> So yeah, she thinks this is amazing. just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Very cool mom points, no doubt about it. Yes. Um, we we the, the concept of the reality show. Will you explain a little bit about about the show that they're putting on here in 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 the book? And if there's any chance that we could see something like this in real life, what would it what would that feel like for us? It's funny because Christina had this dream not long ago. She woke up and she was like, "Lo, I dreamt that they were making this." like show into a reality show and she's like and then like five minutes later I was like wait a second this technology doesn't even exist yet like the genetic <laughs> matchmaking because you know a few companies have tried to do it but it's hard because our genome is like 25,000 genes and a lot of these companies are looking at like compatibility across one or two genes and it's like if you had a dating questionnaire with 25,000 questions mm -hmm. and they aligned you with somebody based on two answers like you wouldn't go for that so there's just so much work that's required behind it but the idea basically is there's a scientific genetic compatibility test, not com genetic similarity, but genetic compatibility that looks at genetic sequences that are correlated with happiness in long-term marriages and long-term relationships. And so the question is, can the science predict, um, you know, a soulmate and can an audience watching two people or, you know, fizzy with a group of people sort of fall in love, can they predict which one is the soulmate as determined by science. Mm -hmm. And so the audience votes, there's like eight heroes, fizzy dates, each of them goes out with, on dates with them. And the audience watches these dates and votes on who they think she's um, should be eliminated until they choose a winner at the end. And they see if they have chosen the one that was predicted by the genetic assay to be her soulmate. And so she's like, I'll do this, but you have to let me choose what kinds of heroes are going to be on this show. And so she has a lot of input on it and she and Connor are very collaborative with it. And um, I want it to be a reality. Like I would love to watch the show specifically yeah. with Fizzy and Connor <laughs> involved. <laughs> Yeah. Who wouldn't? I would also take I would also take a show that is basically built like a romance novel. Like yes. let's have it, let's have a heroine and let's find her heroes. If, mm -hmm. if somebody wants to do that, they can like let us know. Totally. Yeah, exactly. Not for us to be in it. No, no. <laughs> you no, would no. do that, you would do the casting and the expert commentary. There, there you go. go. Right. There and go. here's what's playing out now. And this is what we call this. And it's time yes. to write in her best friend. We better bring Ooh. in a friend from whatever. And then here here we go. Oh, I love yep. this show. I know. <laughs> I love the show already. Oh, real quick. Uh, one thing I love, too, about the, the books and what she says and how you're feeling as you're reading it, as and as you kind of referenced earlier, is joy, right? Um, kind of uh, no um, self-consciousness about what we enjoy. And, and that's one of the things, too, that I feel like reality television. I still, I think yeah. all of these years later, my husband's always like, oh, really? You're still watching, like, The Housewives? That's interesting. And I'm like, what's wonderful? Because I like it. And it's, it's, yeah. it, I escape. And I love when they're screaming at each other. And it's like toting out. It's something that I, I enjoy. And yeah. so um, the idea, you have no guilty pleasures. You have just pleasures mm -hmm. and joy, right? Um, what is something that you indulge in that you think people maybe misunderstand? I mean, romance itself, yeah. honestly, yeah. you know, you know, we write in a genre that is primarily written by and for women, not only there's a lot of men that are diving into it. And we love that. But there is something really wonderful about bringing that escape and release and me time to female readers. And, you know, at the very beginning of the book, 
Fizzy talks about how there's nothing wrong with enjoying bodice ripping. There's nothing wrong with reading fantasies about being tied to the bed or whatever it is. But that's not really what romance is about. Romance is about the idea of centering a female story, putting yourself in the main character of the story, and the fantasy of significance. And so I think we really love that about romance, that it centers females, it centers the heroine in the story, and it allows women to feel seen and understood and important. And so, you know, for us, like, there's no guilty pleasure about escaping for a day on the weekend to go just live in that kind of world for a while. It's very aspirational in that way. So. Mm-hmm. It feels good. Uh, yeah. Last thing, you guys, last we got to talk to you last one year ago, May of mm-hmm. last year, for something wilder. And I just, we were making a comparison with that to um, kind of like a, a new version of like Romancing the Stone, like a, a major, major summer blockbuster movie like back in the day when, you know, going you really had to go to the movies to see everything yeah. and everything was like super exciting and, and amazing. Um, please tell me that that's on the road to being a movie or series. I mean, we, I <gasps> that's a yes, I can, I can say, see it. <laughs> I can say we had more interest in that book than any other book we've written. Really? So odds are good. I think it's just because you're putting, you put it out in, a, in an environment that's so unusual for this kind of story. If like everything's in the city and, and it was, we could see it being shot out in Arizona or, you know, the yeah, landscape yeah. is Utah and all of that. Um, ooh. That's exciting. Yeah, I know. We're excited too. So let's, we'll support the writers in the strike and yes. we will hope that they all come back and exactly. do fun things. And yeah, just, you know, super excited for what's to come. Oh, yeah, sure. well, wonderful, wonderful to talk to you and uh, equally wonderful. Oh my gosh, to, to enjoy this book. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. As uh, our friends are listening and watching this right now, you can pick up the book today. So ladies, uh, congratulations, and um, I mean, it's just a pleasure to, to see you and a pleasure to read your work. Uh, so the L- True Love Experiment. Thank Yay! you so much. Thank it was so you. good to see you. Thank you. And we'll talk more about DNA next time because I, too, mm-hmm. have the waxy ear genetic. It's a genetic <laughs> thing. It has nothing to do with not being clean. Can we clarify that? Yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> we do use Q-tips, people. We do. Yep. Bye, ladies. Bye. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.